So hello everyone, uh, my name is Hank Childs. I'm a professor at the University of Oregon. Uh, thanks for joining us for this tutorial that's titled ECP Software for In-Situ Visualization and Analysis. Um, so this tutorial comes from folks from three different ECP Viz and Analysis teams. And so there, there's a, a, you know, a big group uh, behind putting these materials uh, together. And you'll hear from all of these people um, uh, you know, through the next 90 minutes. Um, so this, this slide kind of captures the challenge we were trying to face when we started with uh, ECP. Um, on the right here, this was a highlight slide that we made um, back in, in 2016 or so um, that talked about the successes of our post hoc tools, Paraview and Visit, and, and the impact that it had on the community. And as we looked forward to Exascale and the Exascale machines, um, we realized that we, despite those successes and despite that investment, a million downloads, hundreds of person years, we had some major challenges uh, that, that we were facing. And so the three major challenges that we identified uh, were support for many core architectures uh, because these tools, Paraview and Visit, were using BTK and its parallelism was primarily based on MPI. Um, IO limitations, we're gonna require in situ processing, meaning processing data as it's, it's generated. And these exascale simulations, we're gonna require new methods of analysis and visualization. And so as we, we as a community, as we thought about how we wanted to tackle this problem, uh, we divided into to multiple groups. And so one of these groups is the ECP VTKM group. Um, and this is focused on problem number one, looking at mini core architectures using the GPUs that will be on the exascale machines. Um, ECP Alpine is another ECP funded effort that's focused on problem number two. Uh, so IO limitations will require in situ processing. And it's also focused on problem three, although the ATDM Cinema project is also um, focused on a specific approach for new, new artifacts. So these three groups are working in a complementary and coordinated way to solve these problems to deliver the sorts of solutions that we were able to deliver at, at Petascale, but to do it again at Exascale, although in a different form. And in particular, uh, you know, with a push towards in-situ processing. So again, what is in-situ processing? In-situ processing means processing the data while it's being generated. Um, the idea is to take your visualization and analysis routines and couple them with the simulation code. Uh, the concern is that the disks on the exascale machines will not be able to keep up. The ability to generate data is going up much faster than the ability to store and load data. And so doing visualization while the simulation is running uh, bypasses that problem. Um, and so you know, that's one of the big advantages is that you can save on, on uh, slow IO times. Um, it also allows you to access a lot more uh, data, a lot more temporal resolution uh, that, than you could previously. Uh, there are uh, so, some cons. Um, and so you, know, you need to know what you'd like to do ahead of time, or you need to have a plan for maybe reducing, transforming, and reducing the data set. Um, and, and this is different. It's no longer outputting files. It's now taking libraries and, and bringing them into your, your simulation code. This is the tool stack as we envision it. On the left are ECP applications. Uh, the next column are ECP infrastructures. And you can see there's three solid red lines. This one here is for what the Alpine project is doing. This one down here is for what the VTKM project is doing. And this one here is for what the Cinema project is doing. And so the Alpine project is delivering infrastructure. You're gonna hear about two of those infrastructures today. Ascent will be a major focus of the tutorial. And Paraview Catalyst, this is uh, the most we've spent talking about Paraview Catalyst for while we keep increasing this uh, in, in the presentation because there's, there's uh, you know, uh, interesting catalysts. Um, and also looking at new algorithms. So in situ is different and what are the ways that we wanna reduce data or transform data um, so that we can understand it afterwards. Um, one of those transform and reduce ideas is the Cinema project, and that has been viewed as it's so important that it has its own project focusing on that. Cinema will be the second part of the tutorial. And then um, VTKM, the approach for making this run on many core architectures, underpins everything we're doing, and you'll hear from the VTKM team as well. Here's an outline for the tutorial. Uh, Cyrus and Nicole from Lawrence Livermore will be talking about Ascent for 40 to 45 minutes. Terry Turton from Los Alamos will be talking about cinema for 15 to 25 minutes. Ken Moreland from Oak Ridge will be talking about VTKM for five to 10 minutes. And Corey Wetterer Nelson from Kitware will be talking about Catalyst for 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, if everyone takes on the high end, we'll be squeezed to get into 90 minutes. I don't expect that's what's gonna happen. I think people will be more towards the low end. And I'm hopeful this show will have a few minutes at the end for questions. 
Uh, so that's all I had. And uh, Cyrus, I'd like to hand off to you. All right, sounds good. You can hear me again, just double checking. Yep, great. All right, I'm gonna share my slides. I confirm okay. the desktop. It's good. All good. Good. Okay. All right. Let's get started. So um, as Hank mentioned, the first part of the tutorial is going to be focused on ascent, which is a flyweight in situ visualization analysis uh, framework that we're building. And um, Nicole is going to help me present this. And we're going to aim for about 40 minutes here. There's going to be some hands on that you'll be able to follow along with. We'll, we'll pause to give people a chance for that. For folks that are going to be watching this after the fact, um, the, uh, the live servers there won't be available, but there is a way to fetch a Docker container if you want to follow along with the exercises. And we won't be able to do everything that we have as part of our tutorial, but we want to try to give you a taste. So that's the plan. All right. First, thank you very much to Livermore and ECP for funding this work. So without it, it would not be done, right? This has uh, been important support for us for several years. And some important links and contact info to get out out front here um, are... Our code is developed on GitHub under the Alpine-DAV organization, and our documentation and all those things you can find from GitHub, but they're also posted here. Later, I'm going to show um, where this landing page is that'll get you to your own uh, Jupyter notebook to run these things. And then there's my information and Nicole's information if you want to ping us um, after the fact. All right, so what is Ascent? So Ascent's an easy to use flyweight, flyweight in situ visualization analysis library that we focus on um, building for HPC simulations. So what does that mean? Um, we want to make it easy to, for you to be able to do the common things you need to do in situ. So while your simulation is running, we wanna support rendering. So that's making pictures, doing things like ISO surfacing, um, transforming data, and then finally, since not going to do everything. So um, we want to make sure there's a way to capture data in situ and, and maybe do some other post hoc um, after that. So um, since started around the beginning of ECP, so compared to some other tools, it's a young effort. However, it already supports uh, most of the bread and butter visualization operations that you would be interested in. It provides an infrastructure that allows us to integrate custom things if you'd like to. So you could, you could pop your own filters in there. And finally, it provides C, C++, Python, and Fortran APIs, which are important for, uh, for our codes. One of the big focuses on uh, for Ascent was to have this flyweight design that was going to be able to leverage our exascale machines. What does that mean? Well, obviously, distributed memory support is important. And then the other part of the equation is CUDA or HIP or et cetera, so many core execution. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how how we do that, and that's um, mostly done in part of tools like BTKM, which provide performance portable ways of writing algorithms. But just to tell you uh, an early success story that we had, which was several years ago now, um, we were able to run uh, alongside a simulation using all 16,000 GPUs on Livermore Sierra cluster during the acceptance process. So that was a while ago, but that was proof that we were able to um, use this strategy and to share data with the, with the uh, application, which was also using GPUs. Another focus is lower memory requirements than current tools. So um, it's a little bit tricky running constrained in situ, right? We have to share the memory constraint, the memory space with the simulation. So, um, you know, the fact that it's a little bit more slim is good. And then we also have a lot less dependencies. Um, so we don't depend on things like um, windowing toolkits or OpenGL. Right. Finally, we've embraced SPAC and we use SPAC to build and, and deploy Ascent. So since ready for common cases, um, so the things you would expect to find, again, I guess the 80% of what a lot of people do day to day are certainly there. So things like clipping, um, doing contours or uh, volume contours, which we call isovolume, slicing, et cetera. Uh, we have ways of rendering pseudo color plots, doing volume rendering and also drawing meshes. So again, this is this is the basics of what people go to immediately whenever they're trying to do, um, do in situ visualization. We also have connections to the Alpine algorithms that are being developed, and those will be deployed with Ascent. So how do we do this in a performance portable way? We leverage VTKM, which you'll hear a bit about more later when Ken talks. Uh, VTKM provides us with the algorithms and the ability to run on whether it's CUDA or HIP, etc. We also leverage MFIM, and we have a uh, built-in ray tracer called Devil Ray, which is a high-order ray tracer that runs performance portable as well. 
So we, we have a kind of a mix of things to bring the features to you. Another important thing is, is we don't wanna just make pictures, right? Uh, we need to be able to capture data and uh, manipulate it while we have it in memory. And a lot of the visualization tools focus on that as well, because they have this nice rich infrastructure for manipulating the data. Ascent is also like that. So we also support things like drive fields. That's where you, you've published some data to Ascent, but you wanna do some calculation in order to construct something derivative. So in this case, the example on the left shows taking a gradient and then calculating vorticity from a velocity field on the fly. We also support things like time histories, line outs, um, collapsing things spatially. Those are all very coarse ways of getting an understanding of your data. And they're very useful. A lot of codes have those built in, but some do not. So it's nice to provide that as a common feature. And also a good amount of research and ascent has been focused on triggers. So the idea here is that um, people are scared when they're really gonna use an in-situ framework that they have to know absolutely everything that they wanna do beforehand. And triggers give you a way to adapt things and not waste resources, right? So, so you want to craft a trigger, which is like an if this, then that um, mechanism such that when something interesting happens, you can save something out or make a picture as opposed to always having to hedge and make a picture all the time. And, you know, really uh, not using effective resources on the supercomputer. Another important thing is extracts. So the ability to get data out, um, very important and for, for there will be still post hoc um, analysis done. There's a couple of different flavors of that. Scalar images are very nice because this allows you to effectively render things or ray trace things without baking in the color map. You can kind of go back after the fact and tweak the color map and get a better picture. So that's, that's a very nice feature. We have ways of getting things out to HDF5, ways of dropping into Python, and there's also a way to connect to Jupyter as well. All right, so in ECP, which is one of our biggest focus areas, uh, we have focused on um, these co-design centers in order to make it easy to get data from these, from these common frameworks into Ascent. So in terms of SEED and AMRX, um, a lot of work's been done you know, to wrap infim data into, into a representation we can read in the same for AMRX. So takeaway from this slide here is if you're working on one of these teams, um, your data is probably already wrapped and probably already available to, um, to access and ascent pretty easily. So if you're not, there's obviously ways to do that. And we'll, we'll cover that very briefly in the introduction. What we like to think of this is, hey, inset, it, it, ascent is really just a, you know, it's a pipeline or it's a connection that gives you capabilities um, in terms of a whole bunch of range of things that you want to do from basic rendering all the way to some of the more complicated algorithms that um, that ascent or that that the Alpine project is um, is creating. All right, uh, I wanted to share one result. Um, this is an interesting one, just to to um, I guess uh, give some context here. So some things we've been using ascent for. Um, in this case, um, we have a simulation code that's modeling a real experiment of lasers hitting a target. And what we're interested in is the velocity on an interface that's breaking out. So in real life, there's a Visar system that, that measures this. And in our simulated world, we'd like to be able to do something that's effectively the same. So with this and with some of the features in Ascent in terms of trying to find and do binning and line outs, we can effectively create a virtual Visar. You can think of it as that way to give us the velocity at this interface. So that's one example. Another really, um, really interesting example that, that also connects our simulation to real world is another, um, another simulation that we, we lovingly call big laser tiny box because there's a big laser and there's a tiny box. And um, in this tiny box, there is a perturbed surface. And when the big laser drives it, um, you get a Kelvin Helmholtz um, roll up, which is a very interesting thing. And we can do simulated radiography using ascent. So those are the pictures on the top. And then we can compare those to the experimental radiographs. So um, that's just another example. All right, so today we're gonna to teach you about ascent, its API and what you can do with it. Um, so what you'll learn is you'll learn how to use conduit and conduit is how we talk to ascent. That's a way to think about it. You'll learn a little bit about how to get your simulation data into ascent. Um, again, we, uh, we have it an easy pass for MFEM and AMRX folks. Um, but we'll, we'll show you a taste of what it looks like to publish it as well. And then we're going to tell you how to tell Ascent, please, please make some pictures for me 
or please do some analysis for me, right? So you'll get some of the basics. I want to um, just say that our tutorial documentation has all of these materials, um, all these materials installed in Ascent installs that exist. And there's a few of them say on Summit and Perlmutter. We don't have um, public ones ready on Crusher yet, but we're working on that. Um, but uh, all these materials exist uh, exist with our installs and they're all online. And then also we have a Docker container, which you'll see that you can get access to if you wanna play around. And this is the, the Docker container is the absolute quickest way to do everything because you don't have to worry about building or anything. You can just kind of hop in and start playing around. All right. Um, so we're gonna learn about Ascent. So Ascent only has, let's see there's chat. Do we have a question? Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that was me, Sarah. Sorry to disrupt you. I just wanted to yeah. put the link there. Nope. Good. Good. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, so Ascent has uh, really just has five top level top level functions. So, open and close, which are just allow you to initialize and finalize Ascent. Publish, which is how you hand data to us, so we can do something with it. Execute is allows you to tell Ascent what you want it to do, and then info. It allows you to ask what happened or get a whole bunch of details about what happened if, if, if either something went right or wrong, right? So great, so we have these, these uh, function calls. Um, what do we hand to them? So the answer is um, we pass them a, a tree, which is called a conduit mm -hmm. tree. And with that, um, we can express a whole bunch of rich, rich context to Ascent and provide a, a, a interface to do all kinds of complicated things. So. You need to learn a little bit about what a conduit tree is before you can learn how to use Ascent. I will say that um, what this really boils down to for a lot of folks, it, eventually I'll, I'll ruin, ruin the surprise, is you, you write little YAML files, right? <laughs> that tell you how you'd like Ascent to do things. You, you write YAML files to ask for pictures or you write little YAML descriptions to ask for you to do extracts. And that's kind of the, what we're gonna be teaching you here. But that's all supported through a project called Conduit, which is another project that we work, we've been working on for quite some time at Livermore. And Conduit is the way we've been providing um, to build interfaces for in-memory data description between different parts of simulations and, and you know, visualization tools, et cetera. So what is it? Um, so Conduit gives us this API for basically describing trees. So trees of data were hanging off of the leaves are, uh, are arrays and they're in memory arrays. So it can describe things that already exist or it can own them. So there's a lot of flexibility. Zero copy is supported through that. That's very important. It provides us C, C++, Python, and Fortran APIs, which is how we can do things easily in, in Scent as well. And on top of this, um, we have this general capability for passing trees, right, that, that can be to your heart's desire, you can describe whatever you'd like. Um, we have on top of that some conventions for what we expect for standard trees, right? So the biggest one is called the mesh blueprint. That's how we describe simulation meshes. So we make sure that, you know, when someone passes something on the other end, someone will be able to interpret it as a mesh with fields, pressure, density, et cetera, right? So conduits all built on this in-memory description. The nice thing is, is that once you have that rich in-memory description, you can have very, very nice, simple IO interfaces for moving things around, right? So we can save things to HDF5 and get them back, or we can ship things around with MPI, right? Because we have this rich description of this data. So Ascent uses Conduit um, really to build out its API. So Conduit is, the, is, like I said, the way we can do C, C++, Python, and Fortran interfaces in Ascent. It also enables us to use YAML, which you'll see examples of that. Right, conduit's the thing that parses the YAML. We can do zero copy of large arrays, which is very important. Again, we wanna lower memory overhead. We don't wanna to have to copy everything in order to compute it. And then finally, this blueprint of how we provide meshes gives us a standard um, for expecting the different data fields and learning how to parse them. So um, we're gonna jump into, into uh, I guess, the tutorials now. We're gonna go into the, the Python notebooks first, but I want to show you C++ quickly. This is our example that we call the first light example. So I'm going to show it here. It's also on this web page. Um, but effectively, what we're doing here is we're starting up a very simple C++ program. 
we are generating an example mesh using Conduit's built-in example. So Conduit has a whole bunch of different flavors of supportive mesh it has. So we try to have all these examples that you can generate on the fly to get an idea of what they look like. We open a scent, so great. We get, get an instance and we set it up. We pass it the mesh that we generated before. And then we, uh, we tell Conduit, hey, I want you to do something for me. In this example, we're asking it to make a picture of a field that we already know exists. And just to jump straight to the takeaway here, um, this code here basically creates this tree structure, but here's the equivalent YAML, which is much easier to think about, I think. Um, in this case, we want to add a scene and we want to make a pseudo color plot of something called braid, which is on our example. Um, this will make a little bit more sense whenever we get into the notebooks and I want to spend a good amount of time there, which is why I'm going quickly. Um, after that, we ask Ascent to execute and we get a picture, right? So we get a PNG out on desk, disk, right? So that's, that's the most basic example. Um, so a sense interface is divided into a couple different, um, couple different composable building blocks. Today, we're going to focus a lot on scenes and pipelines. Um, they're just based on the time constraint, but there's also ways to get data out. You'll hear a little bit more about cinema extracts, which are one example of that um, in the cinema presentation. And then there's also... Um, so also several examples for, for doing queries, which are ways of asking quantitative, like summations, things of that nature, or triggers, which I talked about before. Something interesting happens, you'd like to maybe do one of these other things, render a picture, right? But today we're gonna focus on and up to pipelines. All right, um, so let me, let me uh, switch back to sharing my full screen so we can see what's going on here. And... Okay. All right. So to get started here, um, you can go to ascent dav slash tutorial. So let's pop that in the chat. It's a slightly different page. And when you land here, um, you have two options. So we have a set of cloud servers running notebooks right now you can connect to. You can also run with Docker yourself, which this command will fetch it and run it. Um, I'm going to run with Docker. I would encourage you to probably click here. And when you click here, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of different servers available. I put, put up 40 of them. If you hit request, you'll end up in a spot where you can click through. We'll be there in just a second. So work on that if you'd like to while I, while I fire up um, this Docker container locally here. If you have questions, uh, let us know. We'll try our best to answer in real time here. And Cyrus, you're being nice saying click on it if you want to. Your intent is that people would click on it and would be following along within the Jupyter Notebook. Yes, and we'll keep them open for longer than we're able to talk for a little bit later today. So people can just play around with them if they like to. Good, and, and just so you know, I've gone through the, the sequence now and I am, I am in and it works for me. Okay, great. So, so we had four of them claimed. Go, go go ahead and go in there and get one if you'd like to. Um, and I am going to, I'm going to connect to my, uh, sorry, I'm going to connect to my local instance here, which if you run this command here, it'll be forwarded to localhost. And if you made it successfully, you'll land here. So this is a, a Jupyter, Jupyter um, server running and there's a password. If you've made it into the um, cloud servers, the password is the same. The uh, password is learn, L-E-A-R-N, all lowercase. And that's also on the web page and, and on the tutorial notes. Okay, so once I log in, I land in this Jupyter server. On the left here, we can see we have um, our different basics, basic examples that we provide. So they're, they're numbered in order. And um, Many people have used Jupyter before, so, so I'm not going to um, go into all the details here, but each one of these is a notebook that we're going to interactively um, play with. We're going to start with the first one, which is called the Ascent First Light Notebook. It's the exact same thing you just saw in C++, but now in Python, right? So we will run this. Um, so you hit Shift Enter to run these different cells to set things up. To start, we just import some Python modules that wrap our, uh, our conduit and ascent interfaces. 
again, we talk about how Conduit has some example meshes and we're using an example mesh to cheat here to come ready-made data and to take ready-made data and we're gonna plumb that through and make a picture. So what is done here is this, this function fills out this Conduit tree structure, which, is, which, which the root of it is a node. And we will see what that looks like as well. We'll show you that. So I executed that, I created an example mesh. And now here, here is where we do most of our work here. So we create an instance of ascent. Um, when we're running in, inside of the notebook, we want to tell it, please forward any exceptions you have. Um, there's different options for this. Um, you know, if you're running in a simulation code, you sometimes do not want exceptions. So that's our default. We, we want things to keep continue to go on. Um, without crashing your simulation, right? But in this case, it's okay. If we forward exceptions back, we're expecting them. So we set up ascent, we present the data what, with this publish method here. And then we set some actions to tell ascent what we'd like to do. So in this case, um, I am using the Conduit API here to set up a set of hierarchical paths here that they create a tree in terms of, you know, how this magic works, I think the best way to think about it is that these slashes here impose a hierarchy. And we will show you a, a simpler conduit example right after this to give you a better idea. There's not much you have to learn about conduit, but some of the basics you do have to learn. And also effectively, this is um, in building this tree, we can always view it as a YAML, um, a YAML representation. So we're actually going to show that here. So we're going to show you the equivalent YAML that this, this code here creates. Finally, we're going to say, please execute, right? So I'm going to run this and I ran it and we see the equivalent YAML here. Again, this is the exact same example we showed before with the first light. So I'm, I'm asking to add what we call a scene, which is how we make pictures. And in that scene, there's a plot of pseudo color of our field braid, which comes from our example. And we're going to get a picture. Fantastic. So um, we can show that and when we're, when we're in, um, the Jupyter Notebook with the Ascent Viewer widget, which is kind of nice. I can click on this and this will show me all my renders and it'll also show me my actions that were passed, right? Tell us a little bit of information. So this is the picture we get out. Um, Braid's an example data set that has this kind of funny, funny semi-periodic pattern um, embedded in it. All right, so now we've done the exact same thing we did in C++. Um, now we've done it in Python. So let's move on here to, to look at just a little bit of detail about how we use Conduit and why, why that's important. So um, Conduit was heavily inspired by NumPy um, and it's a, it's a multi-language multi -language API. It's implemented in C++, but again, heavily inspired by NumPy. And in, C, in Python world, we actually use NumPy as, as the way to get leaves out from Conduit. But in C++, there's an API that looks a little bit more like NumPy, I guess I would say. Key here is you can think of Conduit as this hierarchical key value um, tree. So it can store arrays, it can store strings. Um, whenever it stores arrays, it stores things like their their uh, bit width, no. so you know if they're 32-bit or 64-bit. It also stores things like indianness and all those things all automatically for you. So the most basic and probably least impressive way to use Conduit Node is just as a kind of like a dictionary as a key value store. So if we take a look at this example, I create a node and I'd like to add key with the, the string value. Well, I get back, oops, I had to start, start at the top, apologize. I get back kind of an unimpressive YAML representation of here's my key and my value is the string. One of the things that makes this really productive is you can use hierarchical paths to build trees very quickly. So the way to think about this is the embedded slashes and the paths are translated into nesting of the hierarchy. So let's look at this example here. It's much like the file system. It's not actually creating files on the file system, but conceptually you can think of it this way, right? So directory one, directory two, value one is 100.5. Fantastic, I get this implied hierarchy here. So with that, you can do a lot of things, right? You can organize your data in many different ways. Another important aspect of this is, um, of course, being able to capture the rays. So we're gonna look at that here. So in this case, we're using NumPy and we're using um, explicitly 32-bit type integers to show a little bit of the Fibonacci set. So we show that. 
Um, this also in C++, you can pass vectors or you can pass pointers and there's ways of describing the pointers, right? Um, so that it knows knows everything about them whenever it, it um, gets them into the conduit node. Really, really important is that conduit supports zero copy. So it doesn't just own data, it also allows you to describe things and then pass that along. So how do we do that? In both C++ and Fortran and Python, we use set external. So set external is a method on the node that tells us, hey, don't copy this data, but please take this description of the data so I can access it later. This example shows um, shows that, right? It's kind of a, 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 we call this, we call it zero copy, we call it external. Other people call it shallow and deep copy, right? There's lots of different terms for this. Um, so, so it's a little bit confusing, but this is all wrapped up in this example here. We're doing the same thing we just did before. We had a Fibonacci sequence, but in this case, in one case, we're going to use a set, which is equivalent to an equal, and that's gonna copy everything in. In another case, we're gonna use a set external, which is going to point to a NumPy array that already exists. Um, so when we do that, if we go back to our original data and we manipulate it, in the zero copy case, that's going to be impacted and, and noticed by the conduit node, and the other case it's not, right? So this is just an example that proves that. So here we go for the shallow copy or the zero copy case. Um, when we modified the original data structure, which was this numpy array, we see that the data pointed to it was also modified. So um, using this, you can actually mix and match, right? So in, when you're building mesh data to send over, some of it's metadata, maybe strings about what the type is or something like that. And some of it's really big data that you want to zero copy. Um, so this is effectively allows you to have these trees that have mixed, mixed semantics for these things and make it a little bit more efficient to pass, 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 uh, pass things by. All right. So let's see how we're doing here on time. Okay. So I'm going to um, show one example and then I'm going to hand it over to Nicole, because she's going to look at more exciting things. But real quick, I want to show this uh, example of how we present data. I'm going to show the very first one here. So um, again, we present data through this, this set of uh, you know, rules that we, that we built called the Conduit Mesh Blueprint. There's a lot of documentation for it. Um, in this example, I'm going to just show you the very basic how to build a mesh um, in a uniform mesh, which is like the simplest type of mesh you can think about has implicit rules for how it's set up and it's a regular grid, right? So let me show you that real quick. Um, again, everything we do in Conduit is we're building some sort of tree and these slashes are what allow us to impose that hierarchy, right? So there's a couple different rules for what a mesh is. So there's coordinates in space, which are encoded in what we call a chord set. There's the topology, which tells us how those things are, are connected to each other. And then there are also fields. Fields hold things like pressure, temperature, what, whatever it might be, even just some attribute, right, um, that you have. And those are defined on top of the topology. So we have coordinates, topology paints over them, and then fields are connected to that topology. In this example, we describe a very simple grid um, with um, logically three, it's logically 3D with um, the coordinate set has nine in each direction. We anchor it in space with this origin, and we provide some, some rule for how we increment between these. Since this is a really simple grid, we can just say, hey, the topology itself is uniform, and it will inherit everything it needs to know from the coordinate set. And then we can build a, uh, a set of values just to show an example, uh, example field to plot, right? So in this case, we showed using set external to get the values. So I'm going to run this. The takeaway is here. Here's effectively what we've created, right? We have this tree that has this nice description that we can understand as a mesh, um, including all of its points in space, information about how they're connected, and then in this case, this big old, um, <laughs> big old thing here for uh, for the for the field values. And nice thing that we have here is that there's a runtime um, runtime verification that you can use to make sure everything's okay. Um, so there's Blueprint Mesh Verify. If you run this, um, it'll tell you, hey, I, I, I see that you conform to the rules, great job. If we mess something up, it will give you details about, hey, a coordinate set's supposed to have this and you didn't give it to me. I'm not gonna demonstrate that now because we have time. If you wanted to, you could go back and mess up some of the presentation there and you could see um, this information that you would get. 
So let's go ahead and make the picture of this with a scent, just to give you an idea. So we had our regular grid. It's actually 3D, but our default camera view shows it you know, straight on, so it looks 2D to you. Um, yep, so I, I want to stop there because I want to hand over to Nicole and because she's going to show you the exciting stuff. Um, so this was the very basics. So Nicole, why don't you get set up and, and I'll try to answer any questions while you're getting up and running. Cool, sounds good. Let's see, we can see my Jupyter notebook. Yes, it looks good. Great, so I'm going to be speed running us through uh, two uh, capabilities of Ascent, the first being scenes, the second being pipelines. Let me move all of people's faces. Okay, there we go. So uh, scenes are a construct used within Ascent to render pictures of meshes. Uh, the scene description encapsulates all the information that's required to generate one or more images. Uh, they can either render the mesh data that's uh, been published to Ascent, or it can be the result of one of Ascent's pipelines where a filter has been applied and transformed the data in some way. Um, so we'll go through, let's see. So here we're just importing uh, all the necessary uh, libraries. Um, we're gonna prepare a mesh that actually comes from um, the third module example. Uh, it's just a very similar like uh, uh, triangular pyramid uh, mesh with uh, two variables, var1 and var2, that are mirror images of each other. Uh, so the first example for our scene was, is we're gonna use multiple scenes to render different variables. Um, so here we're instantiating a scent, opening it, we're publishing uh, the mess, mesh that we made um, there. And then uh, to enact a scene, uh, we need to tell a scent that, okay, we have an action, we wanna add scenes, and then we'll describe our scenes. So for this, we're gonna have two scenes, S1 and S2, to render our data set. So the first scene, which is named S1 under our scenes declaration, uh, we're gonna have it be a pseudo color plot of our field var1. Um, and then we'll give it uh, some image name. And then for our second scene, uh, this will be uh, uh, qualified under S2. This will render a pseudo color plot of our field of var2, and we'll also give it its own field name, or sorry, image name. So we can go through and we can look at our actions tree. So here we have our action of add scenes, and then we have our scene declaration, and we have our two scenes that we've declared. So we have our pseudo color of var1 and our pseudo color of var2. So we can go ahead and look at the images that that makes. So here's a rendering of that var1, and then uh, var2 is just a mirror image of that. We'll go ahead and close this out. So our next example is rendering multiple plots in a single image. So say you want to render uh, two field variables, or you want to render a field variable on top of the mesh data. Um, so here, our action, we're going to be adding our scenes again. Um, it's a, an individual scene, so we're only making one image. So it's, uh, we only have our scene S1. But then under plots, we're going to have our first plot, which is a pseudo color of var1. And then we're going to have a mesh plot of uh, p2. Um, and then we give this our image name. So then we can see our actions tree. So here we have our scene, our scene one, and then our two plots that we described, one being the pseudo color, the other being the mesh. We can go ahead and see how this renders. So here again, we have that TED example. Um, but now we have this white outline of the rendering of our mesh. The third example is uh, how can we adjust our camera parameters? So all the examples we've seen so far, you've been given the default camera, uh, default camera where uh, you're zoomed out a little bit, data centered, uh, pointed down the Z axis. So now we'll give a little examples of how we can make uh, some changes to our camera. So again, we're gonna be adding our scenes. Uh, let's see, it looks like we're uh, rendering a single scene. It's um, a pseudo color of var1 again, but in this case, we want to do two different renders, and we're going to be changing um, our rendering parameters. So the first render, r1, we're going to be changing the angle that we're viewing our data by changing the camera azimuth, and then our second render, r2, uh, we're going to be changing our zoom factor, but this is again uh, back on our default camera. Um, and since we're doing two renders, we're going to get two different images, so we need to get each of them um, an image name. Let's see, so we'll take a look at our action file, which is always our action tree, which is always nice. So we have our scenes, individual scene uh, of pseudo color var one, but then two uh, different renders, one changing the azimuth, one changing the zoom. And we can go ahead and see this output. Okay, so here, here you can see, uh, you know, the angles changed a little, a little bit. So that's our first render where we changed the azimuth. And then here is our default camera where we're zooming in um, on our mesh data. 
So the next example is changing color tables. Um, so let's see. So it looks like we're going to do two different scenes here. Uh, for our first scene, S1, we're going to render a pseudo color of var1. But in this case, let's change our color table to be veritas. And you can look at our uh, color table documentation to see what other color tables are provided within Ascent. Um, and then for our second scene, again, we're going to render a pseudo color of var1. But in this instance, we're going to use a color table called Inferno. So let's go ahead and execute that. So here's our, our scene tree, which is always nice to look at. So our first scene, pseudocolor var1 using Veritas with our image name. Scene two, a pseudocolor var1 using Inferno in the image name. So we can go ahead and look at uh, what that produces. So here is var1 using Veritas, and then uh, var1 also using Inferno. So not the best, but uh, you kind of get the idea of how you can play around with your different colors. So uh, the next uh, thing I'll be talking about is called pipelines. So this is how uh, Ascent can use filters to transform the data that's uh, been published to it. So this is where users, uh, you can specify, you know, the typical geometric transforms like clipping and slicing, or you can do your field-based transforms such as thresholds and contouring. Um, then uh, what you want to do with your pipeline is you, your data flows through it, and so what it needs is a sync. So you can then use this pipeline output as the input for your scenes and your extracts. Um, uh, also, each pipeline can contain one or more filters that will transform the published mesh data. So let's go ahead and set up our libraries. And then uh, for all of these examples, we're going to be using uh, the built-in braid mesh from Conduit Blueprint. Uh, we're going to specify the geometry as hexahedron, and then we're going to have 25 elements in each uh, uh, axis direction, and then uh, populating our mesh conduit node. So our first example is we're going to apply a pipeline with one filter, and it's going to be of type contour. So in this instance, right, our action is going to be adding pipelines, and now we need to describe the pipelines we want to add. So uh, our pipeline is going to be PL1, and it's going to have a contour filter. So that's going to be a F1. And so that's where we specify the type being contour. And then we also need to specify all the necessary parameters for this contour filter. Um, so one, we need to say we're going to apply this contour to the field braid. Uh, we can also specify either the number of ISO levels or um, in this instance, we are specifying specific ISO values that we're going to apply. Um, so our data will flow through this pipeline and it'll apply the contour filter. So uh, what we need to do now is uh, have a sync on the back end. So in this instance, we're going to add a scene. Um, and much like our other examples, it's, it's going to be a pseudo color plot of our field. Uh, but the important aspect here is that we're going to specify that uh, we want it to be attached to our pipeline PL1 that we created uh, with our contour attached to it. So we can go ahead and execute this look at our action tree. So we have our actions of adding our pipeline, our pipeline PL1 using our filter F1 of contour on the field braid with the specified ISO values. And then we have our scene, which is going to do a pseudo color rendering of braid from the output of our pipeline PL1. So we look at our output and we end up getting something like this. So uh, we kind of, we saw a pseudo color of the original braid. So this is with the contour applied to it, which I think looks pretty cool. Very Spider-Man-y. Um, so we'll go ahead and close that. So our next example is combining, or combining multiple filters within a single pipeline. Uh, so in this instance, we're going to have our first filter, F1. It's going to be our uh, threshold. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, also specify the necessary parameters for this threshold filter. Uh, so it'll be acting on the field braid. We're going to give it a minimum and maximum value. So it'll keep elements within the values of 0 and 0.5. And then we're going to specify a second filter. So this will be a clip filter. So first, our data will pass through our threshold filter. Uh, then it'll pass through our clip filter. And in the end, you are going to have a combination of uh, transformed data that's gone through both of these filters. Uh, so our second filter, F2, that is also attached to our pipeline PL1, is going to be a clip. We're going to make it a spherical clip uh, centered at 0 with a radius of 12. And then again, for our scene, we'll just do a pseudo color rendering of braid. Uh, but we need to make sure that we're telling it, OK, it's coming. Our, the input is coming from this pipeline uh, PL1 output. So let's go ahead and execute that. So we end up getting an image like this. So we can see uh, you know, that these cubist shapes are coming from our threshold filter. And then you can see the sphere has been removed uh, based on our clip filter. 
So our next example is going to be a combination of example one and example two. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create uh, multiple pipelines. One is gonna use a single filter and the second pipeline is gonna use multiple filters. And then we're gonna render them both in a single image. So that's gonna take an example from uh, our previous scene examples. So uh, our first pipeline, PL1, is just going to apply that contour filter from example one. Uh, so uh, filter F1 is gonna be a type contour. It's going to be enacting on field braid with the specified parameters with ISO values of 0.2 and 0.4. We then wanna specify a second uh, pipeline, we'll call this PL2, which will then apply the threshold filter first, followed by the clip filter, F1 and F2, respectively. Uh, we'll specify the necessary parameters for these. And then in our scene, how we combine them is how we combined uh, our uh, field and our mesh plot. So we're gonna uh, define a single scene uh, with two different plots that will both point to the output of our pipelines. So here we'll have scene one, uh, plot P1 will be a pseudo color, and this will point uh, from, to the output from pipeline PL1, rendering field braid. And then our second plot that will also get rendered is a pseudo color rendering of braid from our output of pipeline PL2. So we can go ahead and see what this looks like. Uh, so here's our actions tree. We have our pipelines, the first pipeline applying just the contour filter, our second pipeline applying first the threshold, then the clip filter. And then our scenes um, rendering a single scene uh, with two different plots, the first being the pseudo color of the output from PL1, and then a pseudo color from the output from PL2. So what we end up getting is a combination of those first two examples. And that's all I have for you. Thank you, Nicole. So yeah. Good job. So we went, we went fast today, everybody, but uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the goal here is to just give you an idea of, of what's involved. <clears throat> and, uh, in, in, and we're happy to answer any questions, you know, either through the chat or offline, you can, you can uh, connect with us. I'm going to leave the notebooks running for a while if folks want to play with them more if you're already in them. There's a bunch of different examples. Um, and I think now we're going to uh, hand over to Terry. And Terry's going to talk about cinema. Hello, so let me get my stuff set up. Oops. I guess if we have a question, for, oh, never mind. Terry's got it. Terry, it looks okay. great. Okay. It doesn't look like I'm showing. All right. Looks like I'm showing the right thing. Okay. So um, my name is Terry Turton, and I am a staff scientist at Los Alamos National Lab. And I'm going to be talking about cinema, which is a novel approach to creating data extracts in situ that can then be used to support post hoc um, analysis. And, um, and so, okay. Um, I'll be introducing the cinema ecosystem, describing the database specification, how to generate a cinema database from the pair of you, and exploring some basic cinema viewers, um, and also demonstrate a workflow using the Jupyter, uh, cinema sign mo module. Um, um, and uh, I'd like to just make sure I give a shout out to the whole cinema team. And um, a lot of people have been involved in its development and um, um, just especially a lot of students over the years have added to its functionality. And I'd also like to just call out the support that we get from the Exascale Computing Project. Um, this is, the tutorial is available as a GitHub repo. So you could easily download the repo, run through the, there's a slides are in there to, that um, will walk you through everything. If you want to try exporting a cinema database um, via Paraview, there's the download page for Paraview. Um, if you um, want to uh, follow the work the workflow, you're going to need various Python libraries, and you're going to need the Cinema Sign module. Um, the latest is 1.7.1. And a note on browser security, you need to allow local file access. And one of the ways you can do that is through the browser controls themselves. You just probably want to remember to reset it afterwards. Um, so 
Hank showed this slide and, and, and we all love this slide, so <laughs> we're all gonna show it over and over again. Um, Cinema is part of this in situ workflow. You can write out the cinema extracts in situ from various um, um, uh, uh, infrastructures such as Ascent or LiveSim or Catalyst. Um, and then um, that, so, so it falls under the artifacts um, column of this uh, um, workflow. All right, so what is Cinema? Cinema is an ecosystem and it's built around a simple database set specification. And Cinema actually started with the observation that it takes a lot less disk space to write out an image than it does to write out the data that you then need to render post hoc in order to, um, in order to um, generate that image in a post hoc like pair view or something like that visit. And even thousands of images can take up a lot less space. So rather than um, so rather than saving data, we're just going to um, save everything we want in a uh, in a all the images that we want in a cinema database. And so this is an MPass Ocean uh, database, cinema database with tons and tons of images, um, two hundred and some odd time steps, and many theta and phi angles. But you can go through it in a, um, it becomes very interactive, very simple to, to go through the, to go through, through the images. Um, and it's, it provides that interactive activity that you still don't get with a huge data set that you put into something like Paraview. Um, so the cinema ecosystem, it consists of the database specification and it supports heterogeneous data extracts. The, um, it supports writers that can produce cinema databases and viewers that can then be used to um, um, view those in a post hoc analysis and then different analysis algorithms that can be applied in a post hoc way. Um, cinema has been, um, the, the cinema database specification is based on a CSV format, one row equals an observation, the columns are the metadata or the parameters, the variables, they can point to the data extracts. And again, it's very heterogeneous data extracts. You could have the images, you could have small simulation grids, output graphs, plots, things like that. If you have other data files, um, perhaps run information or something that you wanna include as a text file, you can also do that. Um, and so, if you have mesh files or something, something grid that you want to include, um, that simply becomes one more uh, piece of information per row in the file. And so here's a, a VTI file and a PVD file that's part of the cinema database. Um, and so in the simplest use case, you, the cinema database just consists of a data.csv file which contains any parameters and variables. If you have um, other files, other artifacts, then, then you just need to um, refer to them um, in, in, um, in the rows of the uh, cinema database. Um, in the simplest use case, say you have some, some data with vis visualization per, um, per time step, you simply have to organize those into a data.csv and the extract columns have to be grouped at the end. So all those viz files would be at the end and um, simply refer to them um, within. And then the extract columns have to be named according to a, a specific convention of an FILE or FLE ILE underscore um, um, capitalized. So um, and lastly, you know, the database is, life is complicated, you're going to have empty values, you're going to have NANs, and so any database specification must handle this and any viewers and algorithms must properly um, handle those also. All right, so exporting a cinema database, um, as was mentioned before, Paraview, Catalyst, Visit, Ascent, Sensei, all of these basic um, infrastructures you can use to, you can, can be used to export a cinema database. If you have 
a set of um, um, visualizations on disk. You can organize them They're just through a Python script or a shell script. You can do this direct from user code as long as you just hit the database specifications. Um, and so if the um, looking at the, the case of exporting a cinema database from Paraview, um, the tutorial has a uh, small Nix data set. Um, Nix is an adaptive mesh cosmology simulation code. It's part of uh, ECP. Uh, it describes the evolu evolution of baryonic dark matter in an expanding universe. And over the course of the uh, simulation, the dark matter will organize itself into structures called halos. And so let's just walk through the, the um, Here's a pair of you download page. Um, work through the walk through the, the example. You're going to open up the um, data, the data, and that's in a uh, subdirectory in this tutorial data, Nix baryon density. Um, you're going to select those VTI files, load them into um, load them into the uh, the into pair of you, and then um, you can color by color by the baryon density using the surface representation. And um, the cinema extract is now under the extractors menu. If you used Paraview in the past, this is fairly recent. Um, you're going to choose an image to add to the pipeline um, and select the camera, phi theta mode. Um, and then you could just use the save extracts option. And then through the dialogue, you'll be pointing to a specific directory and you're gonna be adding the um, cinema specification. And there's already a, a um, volume .nix volume cdb subdirectory that can be used to put the images in and the, the database in there. Uh, so let's... Let me do this and let's see. Let me share the other screen here. So here's the pair of you. Um, so again, just to walk through it. Here's the VTI files. It's going to load those. You could do the surface representation for the baryon density. And so there's the, the Nix grid. And over time, you can see those halos form. There's only like 17 time steps. It's a small enough data set that it's easy to work with. Um, and and then you're going to add a um, from the extractors menu. You're going to add an image to the pipeline browser, and we can choose a phi theta representation. So you'll do multiple camera angles, and we can just st stick with the small resolution and then hit the save extracts. You have to put it into a, a um, um, nix.database CDB folder to, to hold the cinema database. And then you're going to generate the cinema specification and then it'll go about its on its way, generating all of the images over all of the angles um, over all of the time steps. So then. Terry, your screen share just stopped. Yeah, I know. I got to start my uh, start back on the other. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. Are we back to sharing? Nope. Let's see, swap those now. Okay. Uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. it's good. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, going back and forth is not the best thing. Um, so when you look at the the new cinema dot cinema 
mix volume CDB, the cinema database. It has the required data.csv file. It has the NICS volume.cdb um, folder contains all of the rendered images um, over all the files, the thetas, and the time steps. Um, and so that's your database. And so, um, so then let's take a look at some of the viewers. And there's an HTML viewer examples.html file, which you can. Um, now go into to wait. There we go. Half a second, my whole thing just died. <laughs> We're seeing your web browser. Okay, can you see the web browser? Yep. Yeah, it just my it, it just locked me out. Sorry. So there's a bunch of different database um, examples using um, the different cinema viewers. So, for instance, in this one, you just have different plots of some sine sine function with um, you know the, just an amplitude of the sine function, and so you're not generating the sine function. You're just showing each plot for each value of um, x over time. Um, in this other cinema view example, this is a common use for cinema view where you would might, um, run multiple simulations and ensemble and you wanna view how that evolves, how that looks um, from different starting parameters, for instance. So this is just your set off blast wave Let's set up the phi, thing, phi theta angles, and you can just compare what happens to those different simulations. So that's kind of a, a common um, use case. Cinema Explorer, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with parallel coordinates, um, the parallel coordinates um, will lay out all the parameters in a file in, in the Cinema database on a set of, of parallel axes. And so the parallel coordinates are, are particularly useful for finding correlations and finding um, outliers. And so Cinema Explorer leverages those parallel coordinates along with an image spread and a scatter plot um, tab um, component. And so I, if you're familiar with the CARS database that's often used in, in you know, examples in, in stacks classes and things like that, um, you can make selections on the parallel coordinates. Um, and then it's really easy to see these correlations. A high, high number of cylinders tends to correlate with most of the ones that get poor fuel economy for these cars. They tend to be heavier. Um, they tend to be faster. Um, you know, moving this down, you notice that as the number of cylinder goes down, the fuel economy on average tends to go up. Um, if you go to the four cars and um, select also the NANs, you see that the viewers handling NANs without any problems. You simply can click on the um, parallel access access to to remove the selection. This is also you know finding outliers. What are the ones that are really slow to get to sixty miles an hour? Well, you know those tend to have few cylinder, lower cylinders, you know, lower power, et cetera. And so um, this is one of the, the um, that just another, another example of the cinema, cinema explorer. Um, and so this is one of our, the, the um, common uses is, is, is to explore data through the cinema explorer um, viewer. So let's go back and um, let me share my <laughs> um all right 
Uh, so then the next the next thing was the um, cinema sci module, and so as um, no. The Cinema Sci module is a Python-based module to um, that does much of the functionality, and it also allows one to to you know use these notebook-based approaches that are so common now in um, in cinema in you know scientific workflows. And so there's a simple um, a simple Jupyter notebook workflow. Which leverages the new Cinema Sci module. Cinema Sci module is available through pip install, and there's information on how to how to actually um, you know install it and and whatnot in the in the repo. Um, and so the simple Cinema Sci workflow just reads in a um, small volume data set. It's going to show it in um, this simple viewer. So here in the simple viewer, it's the same idea as the cinema view, where you can just look at these phi theta angles and look at the simulation over time. And in the next part of the example workflow, we're just gonna bring in two slices of the NICS database simulation and do some analysis on the NICS um, database. So we bring that in. There's just two time slices to keep things pretty simple. Um, two slices and then I think four or five um, time steps. And so we're just going to do some simple analysis on this using OpenCV and some image-based statistics. And so, the, you know, we'll be bringing in OpenCV and some of the scikit images, image statistics. And um, it needs a new database directory, does some cleanup first to see if you'd already done, if this has already been done, it's going to clean things up. And then bring in the um, different libraries we want to le leverage. And we're going to read in the cinema database as a pandas data frame, which is pretty straightforward because it's a CSV file. We're going to set up a bunch of lists for the new output information, the, the analysis variables, um, set up some thresholds and whatnot for the um, um, for the for the um, feature detection. And then we're just going to cycle through all the slices and all the time steps. Um, adding to the cinema database, and it's going to generate all new images for each of the different um, contours that it finds and things like that. Hey, uh, and, Terry, um, yeah. are, you, you, if, are you planning on wrapping up in the next couple of minutes? Yep, I can. Yep. Okay. Thank and you, then, Terry. and then you're simply gonna going to um, update the data frame, and then launch a. Firefox um, with all the different view, the, the new, the old, here's the original cinema database uh, for the Nix. Here's the original Nix slices. And then here's all the, the new, um, the new images. You can see the contours that were, were found. You can do things like find that um, the, the parts with the images with, um, less entropy are the ones that towards the end of the um, simulation, which makes sense as they organize themselves into structure. Um, and um, and actually, the, so there's just a little bit of other examples that are in the um, just visual um, versions of the examples that are in the um, rest of the tutorial. And um, if you're interested, you can just uh, look at those. How to, how to use components and things like that there. And that's it. Thanks so much, Terry, and sorry to rush you. I just want to make sure yeah. we have time for Ken and, and Corey as well. Also, yeah. uh, so Ken, why don't you start sharing? And then Terry, I want you to see there was a message in the uh, question in the chat for you that just came up. So if you could send a response there, that'd be great. 
I assume Terry heard that. Ken, take us away. <laughs> All right. Uh, hopefully my audio and video is working okay. Yep, everything's perfect. Perfect, great. Okay, um, uh, my name is Ken Moreland from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'm gonna talk briefly about VTKM. I'm not gonna dive into details because VTKM really is the underlying uh, component that makes visualization on the uh, ECP exascale hardware possible, uh, but uh, you may hear it uh, now and then, and uh, this is just a quick overview of, of what that means and, and how it's used uh, within the other tools that we've been talking about today. So uh, first, uh, let's talk about why VTKM. So, you know, when VTKM started, there already were visualization libraries available. Um, in fact, its namesake, VTK, has been around since the 1990s, and uh, it forms the basis for a lot of the production visualization tools that we use today, such as uh, Paraview and Visit. Uh, and so it's worth sort of asking ourselves why we felt it necessary to create uh, yet another uh, visualization library. And so the reason for that uh, is it goes back to the slide that Hank brought, uh, brought up at the beginning of uh, this tutorial, where uh, at the beginning of ECP, we did analysis of, you know, what are the, you know, the real challenges uh, for doing visualization in ECP? And one of the big ones uh, was uh, we needed a way to do uh, visualization on the many core architectures that are going to be present on their scale machines, uh, namely now we know uh, Frontier and Aurora. Uh, they get most of their flop rates from these accelerators, these GPU cards, and you know, at the time we didn't have production uh, level uh, software that could actually uh, do analysis and visualization on them. And so uh, VTKM uh, is the software uh, that underpins the ability to actually do uh, visualization algorithms on them. So we've been doing parallel visualization for many years now. Um, and what makes VTKM a bit different is uh, you know, how we model the parallelism uh, within the system. So, you know, since the early 2000s, uh, the, our large scale scientific visualization uh, had a parallel model distributed uh, parallelism as did, you know, pretty much all HPC software um, at the time. And uh, we spent a lot of time making this very scalable. We have, you know, production level tools like Paraview, uh, Vis and Descent that um, allow you to do a large scale uh, visualization analysis uh, using this model. But the problem is, is that uh, as we move forward in ECP, uh, we started introducing a lot of parallelism on the node. Um, in particular, when we have, uh, you know, GPU types of cards, uh, that is an extreme amount of, of parallelism. And we simply can't use the MPI model by modeling each one of these threads as its own MPI uh, process. And so uh, we're using VTKM to exploit the parallelism on the node and then integrating that into our existing distributed parallelism tools to give us the entire hybrid parallelism that we need to be successful uh, at the exascale. So another challenge that we have in ECP, uh, which again isn't, isn't uh, specific to uh, visualization, but uh, is certainly one that's important to us, is this um, I, uh, knowledge that there are a lot of different architectures that we have to deal with within ECP, um, we've already seen a march from multiple different architectures, from the multi-core x86 architectures to uh, CUDAs and Xeon Phi. And now we're seeing that um, at the XX School for Frontier and Aurora, we have uh, yet another uh, iteration of, of hardware Radeon and uh, XE architectures, uh, all of which have their own programming models and APIs uh, built on top of them. And frankly, uh, we didn't have the resources to uh, take the literally hundreds of different types of filters and rendering algorithms that we use uh, within our visualization tools and independently uh, uh, independently convert them, uh, port them to these various different architectures. So VTKM uh, provides a framework and the abstractions required where if you just implement the algorithm once from the VTKM, it can automatically be ported to all of these different types of architectures. Um, and we can do that in a very uh, performant manner. Now that's a big claim. And the question is, is it true? Well, we actually had a, uh, a uh, article in the uh, Parallel Computing Journal uh, that was exploring this, where we looked at a lot of different, uh, a, a lot of different uh, previous publications that had implemented something in PTKM and had compared uh, their algorithm to an algorithm that was written 
uh, for a specific device with that uh, intended architecture. So for example, comparing something written in VTKM with an equivalent algorithm that was written uh, with CUDA specifically for NVIDIA devices. Um, and what we found was that uh, the, the VTKM algorithm was very competitive. Um, and a lot of times it actually performed even better than the algorithm that was designed for a specific uh, device, uh, which seems to suggest to us that you know, we, we've picked the right abs abstractions and um, this is a good, a good mechanism moving forward. So uh, here is just uh, some brief uh, you know, goals that we've made uh, recently uh, with the, the ECP uh, project. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Warp X. Um, this is actually in tandem with uh, Ascent, as, uh, as you heard about earlier uh, today. Um, here's a, a, one particular example uh, that was done last year where uh, they had a you know, 600 GPU uh, simulation on Summit, uh, modeling a, a 10 stage laser wake field accelerator. Um, as I mentioned, uh, VTKM is the underpinning implementation of all the rendering, well, not all the, but the rendering and the computational geometry that's being used uh, in Ascent. And so when you see images like this, uh, I'm sure that VTKM is underneath the covers uh, doing operations of this nature. Um, we've also done other uh, work with Warp X where they're interested in doing a flow analysis of particles within uh, the laser wake field. Um, the problem is, is that uh, in the laser wake field simulation, the flow analysis is a bit different than, uh, than most you know, physical systems where you capture um, the velocity of a flow in this case, you actually need to <laughs> re-simulate particles uh, that have mass uh, as they react to an electromagnetic field. Um, and so the partial differential equations are, are a bit different, but we have a fairly flexible way to do the partial differential equations in VTKM. Um, and we were able to introduce uh, a new set of equations that enable us to correctly uh, show the flow of particles within the laser wake field. Uh, finally, uh, we've been doing work with the whole device model uh, application for uh, fusion reactors. Uh, and they've been doing simulations of the upcoming uh, ITER fusion, fusion reactor, um, make sure everything is working correctly. Uh, and we've been able to, to integrate uh, VTKM into their workflow system uh, that now allows us to create uh, in-situ visualization images like the ones you see here um, as the simulation runs. All right, so that's a little bit of background of VTKM. Um, if you're interested, you may be asking yourself, well, how do I use VTKM? Um, it it, it kind of depends, but uh, chances are that uh, if you're a casual visualization user, you, you already can. Um, once again, bring up uh, this image that, that, as Terry said, all of us are gonna wanna show uh, that uh, we have this integration between the, uh, the software that we use within the ECP data analysis and visualization portfolio um, and VTKM, which you see in the bottom is sort of the underpinning of all of these, these different uh, software codes. So when Alpine is, is developing software to deliver to applications uh, that is intended to be run on uh, the ECP uh, hardware, uh, it's using VTKM underneath the covers uh, to enable that. So if, you're, if, if Alpine is enabling you to do that, um, then VTKM is there uh, allowing you to do it. As I, as I mentioned, VTKM is the implementation being used uh, by Ascent, uh, but we're also integrating it into tools like uh, Paraview and Visit, which um, by proxy gets it into uh, Catalyst and, and Libsyn, uh, and that enables you to, to use it directly. So here's an example of some of the integration of VTKM into Paraview, uh, real quick uh, animation. All you do is you, we have a, a plugin that enables us to very quickly uh, load a VTKM uh, filter within, within Paraview. So once you loaded this, uh, this plugin, um, you'll see that there are now a set of filters that are uh, enabled using VTKM that are just added uh, inside the Paraview application. If you've ever used Paraview, you're familiar with the concept of filters. Um, there's nothing particularly special about these filters other than underneath the covers that are gonna be using VTKM. Um, as we move forward, we're going to start replacing directly uh, a lot of the components within Paraview to directly use VTKM so you don't have to do something special. Uh, so uh, as time passes, uh, more and more of the operations will just simply use VTKM. Uh, same thing with Visit. Um, with Visit, uh, all you have to do is tell it, tell the in the parameters, uh, the, excuse me, the preferences, you just sort of select a VTKM 
as your parallel computation library. And once you do that, any plot or operation that happens to be VTKM enabled, we'll just use VTKM. So once again, here's an example. Uh, we'll have the user. Uh, the user is going to select using VTKM as the parallel computation library. Almost done, Hank. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the user is going to uh, create a contour curve. Contour curve happens to use VTKM at the covers. We'll see that once it's drawn, it looks like it's contours. It just used VTKM at the covers. Didn't have to do anything special. All right, uh, that's all I really have. Just want to include, say that if there's any sort of visualization needs or particular uh, high performance uh, operations that you need, uh, please give us feedback. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, work with that. All right. Super, thank you, Ken. And yes, I am nervous, a little nervous about time. So appreciate you rushing at the end there. Uh, Corey, uh, take us away. And if we spill a couple of minutes past the end and that's what you've prepared, I think that's okay. Well, that's okay. I will try to blaze through my slides and people can email me afterwards if they have questions. Okay, great. Share my screen. Okay, and let's see if I can start this presentation. Can everybody see the presentation starting now? Which screen? Perfect, we see it. Yep. Great, hi everybody, I'm Corey. I'm a senior R&D engineer at Kitware and I'm here to talk a little bit about Catalyst, uh, hopefully as quickly as possible. So. Uh, as we've all been talking about in situ, uh, processing is this extremely powerful and becoming more and more necessary technology for performing uh, data analysis and visualization on these very large simulations uh, that are growing every year. Uh, we typically break this down into two kinds of uh, two kinds of workflows: on process and off node processing, uh, in situ and in transit. Where in situ, we're actually using the same uh, the same uh, computing uh, resource that the simulation is running on to perform our uh, in situ uh, calculations and our visualization. We're in transit, we package up our simulation data and ship it off over a network to some other computer to perform often interactive uh, visualization uh, kind of workflows. So there's an awful lot of benefits to uh, in situ visualization and co-processing. Uh, and I'd love to dig into more details, but we're gonna try to go fast through these. Uh, things like debugging allows you to uh, you know, being able to have rich diagnostics from your simulation as it is running uh, allows you to identify problems really quickly, which can save you an awful lot of time sitting in queues for uh, shared HPC systems, etc. But also allows you to save your data quickly uh, before a simulation may fail. Um, computational steering techniques that are uh, can be extremely powerful and allow you to actually steer your simulation away from a divergent path uh, by modifying steering parameters uh, as a simulation is running, only possible through these kind of in situ infrastructures. Uh, further, having access to a full simulation data uh, while the simulation is churning out data is uh, often more rich data than you might have dumping data to disk and post-processing after the fact. So being able to utilize everything that the solver has available to it uh, can provide wonderful types of insights that might not be possible through kind of traditional workflows. But I think the most important thing is faster time to insight. Uh, avoiding that IO bottleneck that is getting worse and worse as simulations become bigger and bigger uh, allows you to generate insight into what, your, what science you are doing on your simulation uh, faster and faster. Being able to dump out data immediately as it is being generated uh, allows you to gain insight uh, at an optimized rate. And further, more efficient use of these big HPC systems that are becoming more and more heterogeneous. Not every simulation software is optimized to use every piece of a large heterogeneous system. And being able to offload some of that to visualization co-processing uh, allows you to get more out of the out of the uh, HPC resource uh, than you might be able to with just your uh, with just your simulation code. So where does that leave Catalyst? Uh, this is, uh, Catalyst has been around now for almost a decade and a half. Uh, so it's got quite a bit of a history and it's been maturing uh, ever since. Uh, it's hit some pretty major milestones. For instance, back in 2016, it won the, it was a winner of the uh, SE 2016 Visualization Showcase. Uh, this was a uh, simulation of a, a unstructured CFD, uh, unstructured grid CFD simulation of flow past a uh, airplane uh, wing tip, or I guess it's an airplane rudder. Uh, this is actually done by one of my uh, PhD advisors, Ken Jansen, and a number of other people. Uh, but just just gigantic simulation, 256 MPI ranks, uh, 26,000 MPI ranks, sorry, uh, orders of magnitude. Uh, and uh, because Catalyst is able to leverage uh, the scalable uh, VTK library as its backend, uh, it's able to scale uh, to these very, very large MPI counts. 
and generate uh, very large uh, data from very large simulations. Uh, it wasn't possible before and also very difficult to do uh, with kind of traditional post hoc type, uh, type workflows. So uh, Catalyst has uh, continues, continues to add more and more functionality. It's very capable of doing kind of automated in situ visualization and co-processing where you can set up uh, pipelines and run those alongside your simulation. Uh, but you can also do interactive things. So you can connect to a pair view server and actually visualize your simulation as it is being run and interact with that data as it is being generated. Um, and oh, there's also in transit workflows that are capable through pair view and audio. So we kind of have the whole gamut of what is capable, what um, the whole gamut of what is possible with in situ, uh, in -situ processing is available within Catalyst. Uh, it's got a pretty straightforward uh, architecture. Uh, adding Catalyst to any given simulation code usually revolves around three key uh, calls that need to be added to your simulation code. We have an initialize and a finalized step that kind of a little bit of boilerplate set up and tear down of data structures and connections. And we have a process step. And that process step is what shuttles data uh, from, shuttles a data description uh, from your simulation code to Catalyst for post process, for uh, co-processing. Uh, and that data description, we actually fully utilize the conduit API that was described uh, by uh, described earlier in the this tutorial. Uh, so if you're familiar with that, which hopefully everybody is close to familiar with at this point, uh, you are 95% of the way there to using Paraview Catalyst as well. Uh, Paraview Catalyst does its uh, uh, does all of the work in a Python script. Uh, so it actually you describe your uh, your kind of analysis steps within a Python script. And these Python scripts can actually be generated within Paraview automatically. So you have to do very little to set one of these up out, unless outside of uh, using Paraview. Um, so if you're familiar with Paraview, you can get one of these going pretty quickly. Uh, but also what Catalyst enables through the system is a back propagation of information. So if you have steering parameters, for instance, you want to be able to modify time steps or steering parameters or even solver, param or solver parameters or even boundary condition parameters, et cetera, you can set that up to be modifiable uh, through the uh, back propagation of information from Paraview Catalyst to the solver. And so you can actually steer your solver using Paraview Catalyst as well. Pretty powerful. Uh, there's a significant emphasis on efficiency and uh, minimal overhead with Catalyst. So initialization and finalization, very minimal. Uh, also code footprint, we try to keep it as minimal as possible. There's, as I said, three calls that you need to make to the Catalyst API within your simulation code uh, to get this whole system running. And you need to describe your data with a uh, conduit blueprint. Uh, and I've found that even for fairly complex uh, simulation data, this can be done uh, with very minimal code, uh, I, you know, order 50 to 100 lines of code to really describe everything that's going on within a complex simulation, and you are off to the races. Uh, and that is a benefit that we and Ascent share, which is pretty fantastic. Um, Efficiency in computing and memory management. Because we're using conduit data descriptors, uh, we actually take full advantage of the zero copy capabilities of conduit uh, and preserve that. Uh, and we preserve that uh, throughout the Catalyst pipeline. So if we're running in situ, we're able to fully utilize memory in place without doing extra copies or movement of data uh, unnecessarily. Now, because we're using Python scripts for uh, to describe Catalyst pipelines, uh, we actually have a, an extra layer of flexibility here. These uh, these scripts and these uh, these scripts are actually reconfigurable. So as a simulation is running, uh, if you're unhappy with how your data extracts are looking, uh, you can actually just straight up modify your Python script in place. And as the simulation is running, it'll just pick up those changes and run the new uh, run the new pipeline, uh, which allows for extreme customizability. Um, as well as a pretty significant flexibility, and uh, it's pretty uh, pretty forgiving if you get something wrong the first time. Uh, you don't need to stop your entire simulation and restart the thing just to change the angle you're visualizing your uh, uh, you know your propeller blade at. Uh, because Catalyst uses VTK and Paraview, uh, we have the entire suite of uh, of capabilities that those two powerful systems bring to bear. We have, uh, and that allows you to set up these extremely complex in situ pipelines. You can do all kinds of analysis outside of visualization, uh, doing kinds of integrations, statistical analysis, doing plotting and everything is all completely available within Catalyst because it simply exposes everything that VTK and Paraview have to offer. 
I know I'm speeding through this, so hopefully uh, uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to contact any of us and we'll be happy to chat. Uh, so uh, peer, -view, peer review and uh, by extension catalysts are uh, able to generate these extractors, use these extractors to generate kind of user specifiable data uh, that Terry actually mentioned in her uh, cinema pr uh, presentation. Uh, there's a number of other different flavors of extractors, and so you can do all sorts of different data extracts and write very minimal data to disk for post-processing or you know, even just making images for your journal article. Uh, can be done right away without having to redo any post-processing after the fact. So uh, I didn't get the memo about uh, that very impressive slide that everybody has been so excited to show off, but I have my own. <laughs> um, so Peer Review Catalyst is a part of the ECP program through Alpine. Uh, we are the direct connection from simulation codes to peer review uh, through VTK, and there's been a significant effort to ensure that VTCAM is fully supported within Catalyst uh, as a uh, to accelerate all of the uh, various uh, flavors of analyses that you might want to do. Um, there's also been a lot of efforts to implement uh, Catalyst adapters into popular and large uh, simulation codes, such as NFIX EXA and a number of WIN codes. Um, and we're fully supported on Summit, as well as some newer systems that are coming online, Spot Crusher and Frontier. We're going to be announcing, you know, uh, as these uh, as these things continue to evolve. So we're really excited about how many places we're able to uh, we're able to utilize Catalyst and the kind of cool science that people are able to do with it. So as uh, this uh, system continues to evolve, it's been around for 15 years almost, and uh, it continues to evolve with the needs of the simulation. Uh, the simulation community. Uh, most recently, uh, fully functional in the 5.10 release of Paraview is the new Catalyst Adapter API, which uh, has dramatically simplified the cost to develop a Catalyst Adapter. Specifically, uh, we have decoupled Catalyst from VTK and Paraview at uh, compile time. So now you don't need to actually, uh, if anybody's familiar with building older Catalyst adapters into simulation codes, you no longer need to uh, actually link against the VTK and peer review uh, libraries to use Catalyst, which is fantastic. We have a small stub uh, library that you link against at compile time and a uh, and Catalyst will automatically uh, link again, dynamically link against a shared library uh, at runtime so that it can utilize all of VTK and peer review without you needing to do any VTK coding or peer review uh, implementations, et cetera. And we use conduit as kind of the uh, the cornerstone of how we describe data. So because we're using the conduit as is, if you have an ascent adapter in your simulation code, you are 95% of the way there to having a catalyst adapter as well. And so this allows us to be on uh, to maintain parity uh, with all of these other codes, as well as provide a fairly straightforward way of describing data that uh, puts zero copy operations as a uh, at the forefront. So, uh, as I said, being VTK and peer review independent uh, has a lot of a lot, a lot of positives, um, including not needing to link against VTK and peer review, which can be a fairly complicated process, and there are very large libraries to link against. Uh, you might not necessarily want to do within your simulation code. Uh, also, these run because these are runtime swappable, we get all kinds of benefits. Uh, uh, and simplifications to how you actually need to design your simulation adapter. Uh, we support development of other implementations of Catalyst too, which is kind of an exciting, uh, an exciting uh, side effect of this, um, where you might be able to implement uh, a very specific niche uh, operation that is not available in Catalyst currently. Uh, that can be that can be done uh, through the development of a another implementation of Catalyst. Uh, this also allow, has allowed us to develop a really cool debugging system where I uh, called the recorder playback system, where you can actually record what your simulation uh, is passing to Catalyst through Conduit and play it back later. So you can debug how your uh, how your adapter is working and provide um, all kinds of insight into exactly what is being passed from your simulation to Catalyst. So for a developer, this is really extremely useful and saves a lot of time in debugging. Uh, new catalyst implementation, new catalyst adapter implementation. So I'd like to thank you all so much for coming. I'm happy to answer questions. I see I've run about four minutes over. Uh, if you have any questions, I think that we, uh, I'll post my email in the chat or something. And I hope you'll have a wonderful rest of your annual meeting. Yes.
So, so Corey, I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little wrap up. So thanks very much. Great job. Great job to you and all of the speakers. And thank you to everyone for attending. We really appreciate your, your interest in our software. We run these tutorials so we can connect with you and support you. We are happy to stick around and chat with you right now. Um, we're also happy to connect with you afterwards. And so, you know, my name is Hank Childs. Here, let me just put my email in, in the chat and I can get you connected with anybody here. And again, you know, our, our job is to, to get our software out to the ECP user base. And so we, we really do want to connect with you and, and be chatting with you. Um, so, well, you know, thank you for coming. Great job to the presenters. We're going to hang around and answer questions, uh, but, um, you know, we're available afterwards as well. So with that, uh, if there's any questions out there, go ahead. And uh, anyone that wants to drop off, this is, this is kind of the end of the tutorial.